overcome insecurity and even physical illness through changing negative false belief systems. And as you master the totally practical step-by-step -step exercises, you'll find that you'll be enjoying positive results in every aspect of your life. Let me start out by giving you a little background information. The Silver Mind Control Method was pioneered by Jose Silva of Laredo, Texas, over a 22-year period, between 1944 and 1966. His initial interest in mind development was sparked when he was inducted into the Army during World War II and, like all the other soldiers, had to take a series of psychological tests. Silva was absolutely fascinated by the kind of test questions he was asked to respond to, and he ended up interviewing the Army psychiatrist about the field of mind development. The psychiatrist recommended Silva start his exploration by reading the works of Freud, Jung and Dadler, and this began his lifelong commitment to scientific research into the potential of the human mind. During his studies he became interested in methods of raising IQ scores. This interest was especially fueled by some failing grades that had begun to appear on his children's report cards, so Jose decided to find out if he could improve his children's learning abilities and their IQs in particular, through a series of mental training exercises. To begin with, he knew that the brain generates different frequencies of electricity. From his work in the field of electronics, he knew that the ideal circuit is the one with the least resistance, because it makes the greatest use of its electrical energy. Working with his own children, he concluded that the brain received and stored more information at lower brain frequencies. He began experimenting with a series of mental training exercises to do just that, to slow down the brain frequency while remaining mentally alert. I'll be explaining how this works in more detail in a moment. Now, Laredo was a small town. When Jose's neighbors heard from their children that the Silva kids were getting much higher grades, they approached him about teaching their children the same techniques. So over a ten-year period, Jose taught a group of local children how to function at these lower brain frequencies. With each class, he had the opportunity to polish and expand his mind control methods and received even better and better results. The next step was working with adults. By 1966, his classes evolved into a comprehensive training program and Silva started to teach a 36-hour course to the general public. In 1969, the demand for the training became so great that Silva could no longer handle all the teaching by himself, and he trained a group of instructors to help him teach the Silva Mind Control Method. And that was the beginning of the popularization of the world's most famous mind training course. First it spread across the USA, and eventually around the world. Since 1966, the 36-hour Silva Method course has been given worldwide, and now in the 1990s, it is taught in every major city in North America, as well as in 79 other countries in 20 different languages. It has proven to be life-transforming for millions of people from every walk of life worldwide. Why has the Silva Mind Control Method become the most successful mind training program in the world? The answer is very simple. It works. By learning to direct and control your mental powers, you will have the skills to achieve your goals. Whether they are personal, social, or professional, you'll enjoy enhanced energy to accomplish what you want in life, you'll increase your self-esteem so that you function successfully in the world, and, bottom line, you'll be happier. These might sound like huge promises, but let me assure you that if you take the time to master these exercises, and use the principles involved, you will see positive changes take shape in every area of your life. Also, you'll learn an effective method for stress control by taking a mental vacation at this alpha level. Then, you'll learn how to eliminate the negative patterns and belief systems that can sabotage your self-respect, health, performance, and relationships. You'll learn how to maintain a positive attitude and create positive belief systems through a second alpha meditation. Finally, you'll enjoy a powerful mental training exercise called the long relaxation exercise. 
designed to help you strengthen your immune system, keep you mentally centered, dramatically increase your creativity, and literally awaken the genius within you. Over the next two hours, in addition to leading you through a series of exercises, you'll be joining me in one of my seminars, where I'll be explaining various concepts that form the backbone of the Silver Mind Control Method. So let's begin as we now step into the class for an explanation of how the brain and mind work. As you can see on the chart, there are four levels here, beta level, alpha, theta, and, and delta. And the line that runs up and down shows brain rhythm in cycles per second. It shows brain activity as measured through EEG equipment. EEG is an electroencephalograph that measures brain activity very similarly to what an EKG does for the heart. You're familiar with EKG measuring heart activity. It measures the heart in so many beats per minute, as the heart functions in beats per minute. The brain functions in cycles per second. So your brain vibrates in so many cycles per second. The way we are now, with eyes open, wide awake, focused, the brain is probably right around 20, 21 cycles per second as measured on EEG equipment. That brain activity is called beta brain activity, or outer conscious levels of the mind. It's a world of action where we go and do things. It's a doing level. You have the physical world with the five senses operative, sight, sound, smell, touch and taste are fully operative at that level. And time and space as a measuring device, as it took you so many minutes to get here, to drive or to walk or whatever you did from your home. And space-wise, you went through so many miles to go from place A to place B. Now, when you slow down the brain activity, you then, in effect, enter different brain frequencies. If you slow down, you first go through the alpha brain frequency. As you further slow down, you go through the theta level. And then finally, delta. And the numbers go down. In other words, from 20 cycles functioning as beta when you're awake to deep sleep, the brain could be one, two cycles per second. It is deep sleep. So there's a tremendous difference between when you're fully alert and awake and when you're deeply asleep. Alpha, theta, and delta are all three connected with sleep. So those are the three levels that you normally sleep through. Over here, beta is the awake brain frequency level. While we have outer conscious levels of beta here, we have inner conscious levels at alpha and theta. Now, some people will say, why don't you call the inner conscious level subconscious levels? Because maybe they have had that kind of terminology when they went to school or took a psychology course or are in the field of psychiatry or psychology. They're used to the terminology of subconscious. Sub meaning below the, the conscious level. So first of all, we don't use that term because once you learn how to use your mind at the inner conscious levels of the mind, it's no longer hidden. So for somebody who is untrained, this would be subconscious. When you're done with the training, you'll be functioning at the inner conscious levels because you're doing it while you are mentally aware. You're not going to be asleep. You're going to be awake while using these levels. So what we are going to learn then is to slow down the brain activity from about 20 cycles till about mid-alpha, to put a number to approximately 10 cycles per second. We want to function at the mid-alpha range. This is where you can make strong impressions on the brain. And that's what we want to do, right? When you have a goal in mind, you want to create a strong impression on the brain pertaining to your goal so that the brain and the mind is helping you to achieve your goal. In order to learn how to do that, we have mental training exercises. We're going to do specific mental training exercises throughout the 36 hours where we're going to go in and out of these levels. And the key is we're going to learn how to go here, remain mentally awake, alert, and in control while there, and then learn to apply techniques while at that level. Now that you have some understanding of the different brainwave frequencies, you're ready for the first mental training exercise. It's a very brief one, about five minutes. First I'll describe and explain the words and phrases I'll be using in this exercise. 
This is to satisfy the left hemisphere of your brain, the part that is ascribed to logical, analytical thinking. Then I'll guide you through the exercise. And as you slow down the brain activity, producing more alpha brain waves, you'll activate the creative and intuitive right brain hemisphere. So you'll be learning at the beta or logical level and applying what you have learned at the alpha intuitive level. Let's begin with the beta or left brain explanation of this mental exercise. I'm going to ask you to assume a comfortable sitting position. Sitting in a chair is best. Make sure that your clothing isn't too tight. If you're wearing a tight belt, for instance, loosen it up. Kick up your shoes. It is important that you feel physically at ease. When you sit in a chair, rest your back against the back of the chair. You'll find you'll be much more comfortable if you keep your arms and legs uncrossed throughout the duration of these mental training exercises. Remember, these exercises will require your full attention. Do not attempt to do any of them while driving a car or operating any machinery. Once you've found a comfortable position, I'm going to be asking you to take a deep breath and exhale to enter a deeper level of mind. Now, when I ask you to take a deep breath, I really mean it. I really want you to take a deep breath. And the way to take a deep breath is not to pull in your stomach and stick out your chest like a soldier. The proper way to take a deep breath is to fill your lungs and let your stomach expand as you inhale, so that the air can go all the way down into the solar plexus region. This will help you to successfully reach your alpha brain frequency level. So let's practice this for a moment. Take a deep breath, and as you inhale like this, push, not force, push your stomach out, and then gently exhale. Good. Now, continuing with my beta description of what this first exercise will involve, after I ask you to take a deep breath, I'm going to count backwards from 10 to 1 slowly. And just imagine that you're feeling yourself relax more and more as I count backwards. After that, I'm going to ask you to relax your eyelids. As you may know, there are thousands of tiny muscles in the eyelids, and one of the primary areas for tension is the eyelids. By letting go of whatever stress or tension may be in the eyelids, you can evoke the feeling of relaxation. After you have done that, I'm going to ask you to allow this feeling of relaxation to flow slowly downward, all the way down to your toes. Next, I'm going to ask you to mentally go to an ideal place of relaxation. Now, an ideal place of relaxation could be a place that you already have visited, such as sitting at a beach, or being in the mountains, or any place where you have been where you have felt very relaxed mentally and physically. If you cannot think of such a place, or do not know of such a place, you can mentally create one. In the Southern California area, we also hold children's classes from time to time, and one of the favorite places of relaxation for the children is a big fat cloud in the sky, right in the middle of it, gently floating. So feel free to be as creative as you'd like to be in designing the location of your mental vacation. I'll be quiet for a while so that you can enjoy this place of relaxation, and then I will tell you it's going to feel like an hour of relaxation. And even though I'm going to be quiet in regular clock time, a lot less than that, you will find that it actually feels as though you relaxed for an hour or so. Let's begin. We will begin this exercise by asking you to assume a comfortable sitting position. Close your eyes, take a deep breath, and as you exhale, enter a deeper level of mind. To help you enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, I'm going to count from 10 to 1. On each descending number, you will feel yourself going deeper, and you will enter a deeper, healthier level of mind. 10. 9. Feel going deeper. 8. 7. 6. Deeper and deeper. 
five, four, three, deeper and deeper, two, one. You are now at a deeper, healthier level of mind, deeper than before. You may enter a deeper, healthier level of mind by simply relaxing your eyelids. Relax your eyelids. Feel how relaxed they are. Allow this feeling of relaxation to flow slowly downward throughout your body, all the way down to your toes. It is a wonderful feeling to be deeply relaxed, a very healthy state of being. To help you enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, I'm going to count from one to three. At that moment, you will project yourself mentally to your ideal place of relaxation. I will then stop talking to you, and when you next hear my voice, one hour of time will have elapsed at this level of mind. My voice will not startle you. You will take a deep breath, relax, and go deeper. One, two, three. Project yourself mentally to your ideal place of relaxation until you hear my voice again. Relax. Relax. Take a deep breath and go deeper. You will continue to listen to my voice. You will continue to follow the instructions at this level of the mind and any other level, including the outer conscious level. This is for your benefit. You desire it, and it is so. Whenever you mentally or verbally mention the word relax, all Unnecessary movements and activities of your body, brain, and mind will cease immediately, and you will become completely passive and relaxed physically and mentally. I may bring you out of this level or a deeper level than this by counting to you from one to five. At the count of five, your eyes will open, you will be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health. The difference between genius mentality and lay mentality is that geniuses use more of their minds and use them in a special manner. You are now learning to use more of your mind and to use it in a special manner. In the next longer Silva exercise, we will impress and program beneficial statements for your benefit. In a moment, I'm going to count from one to five. At that moment, you will open your eyes, be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. You will have no ill effects whatsoever in your head, no headache, no ill effects whatsoever in your hearing, no buzzing in your ears, no ill effects whatsoever in your vision and eyesight. Vision, eyesight, and hearing improve every time you function at these levels of mind. One, two, Coming out slowly now. Three, at the count of five, you will open your eyes, be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. Feeling the way you feel when you have slept, the right amount of revitalizing, refreshing, relaxing, healthy sleep. Four, five, eyes open, wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. You notice during this last exercise that I read a statement pertaining to genius. Geniuses are individuals who use more of their minds and use them in a special manner. In simple terms, what I mean by that 
is that they use both parts of their brain for whole brain thinking. And you are now learning the skills to do just that. Does this mean I'm telling you that you're a genius? The answer is, yes indeed, you are a genius. Now, you may not be aware of this fact. If you don't know you possess a talent, then you can't make deliberate use of it. What you're learning in this program is how to activate that part of the brain that people more and more consider to be responsible for genius-like qualities, such as creativity, intuition, imagination, and visualization. And by learning to go into that alpha dimension, as you are doing, you will find that those qualities will improve and you'll become better at accessing them any time you wish. Next, let's move on to negative self-programming. That is, when you think and talk about yourself, your loved ones, or the world at large in a negative manner. You can get into real problems with this self-sabotaging habit, because when you repeat something often enough, you actually start attracting what you do not want, creating a lot of unhappiness and problems in your life. You see, what you believe is true for you. If you believe a thing firmly, then it is your reality then, is it not? Sure. If somebody believes that Monday is the worst day of the week, what kind of a day do they have on Monday? Going to have a bad day. If you were to tell the person that that is not true, that Mondays are not the worst day of the week, what will they tell you? They'll insist upon it. They'll say, what do you mean? And now you're going to hear their reasons as to why this is so. You see, you and I are very good at coming up for reasons for our belief systems. If you go talk to people of the Flat Earth Society, they're going to give you wonderful reasons as to why the Earth is flat. Very nice, intellectual, intelligent reasons. If you ask a person why they have lousy days on Mondays, they're going to give you wonderful reasons as to why. Somebody might say something like this. All the work has been carrying over from the weekend. And when, you know, you've been gone for a couple of days. And then when you come back on Monday, you're a little behind from the stuff you left behind from last week. And then, you know, you don't really feel like working. So you sort of have to get into that between what you are behind and getting into the swing of things. Boy, you're going to have a rough day on Monday. Now, this sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, I believe it. But it has nothing to do with the truth, does it? Because there are a lot of people who think that Monday is just like any other day. So what happened to their Saturdays and Sundays and getting into the swing of things? What happened? In other words, it is a personal justification that has nothing to do with the reality. Now, let me tell you what you and I do. You and I come up with personal justifications why we do or why we do not do things. And those reasons we have, have also nothing to do with reality. The reasons are manufactured by us, and the more intelligent you are, the better your reasons. Right? Now, all those reasons are false. And if you catch yourself doing that, where you come up with your reasons, I'm going to give you a little phrase to use instead. Say to yourself, The reason I'm not doing X, Y, or Z is because the sky is blue. (laughs) Because that reason is just as good as any other one you're going to come up with. Because usually we use our reasons to help sell the idea to ourselves and to the people who are listening to us. Let me tell you why I didn't get the work done. Because so-and-so called, and this happened, and then that happened, and I didn't have the time to do it. Oh, okay. That sounds like a good reason to me. The real reason is, of course, for some reason you didn't feel like doing it, so you deferred, you delayed doing it. You said, well, I'll do it tomorrow. That's the real reason, right? You didn't want to do it. Of course, if you had wanted to do it, you would have done it. And, of course, not having enough time is just another reason, right? There are very few things when there is total equality, but there's absolute total equality when it comes to time. No one, no one gets more than 24 hours a day, or less. 
Now, exactly 24 hours every day. So when we say we don't have the time, that tends to be another reason for not doing it. Not doing it. People have all kinds of reasons. We have reasons that we are too young to do a thing. Or we can have reasons we are too old. Or we have reasons we are not ready. Or we have reasons that maybe tomorrow. Or reasons that um, the timing isn't right. And the reasons going to go on and on and on. It is okay to do it as long as you know and do it deliberately. As long as you know that that is not true, you can do it. Be my guest and use it. As long as you know that it's not accurate, that it is just another sky is blue. Now, what happens when you start doing that is you're going to sort of find yourself a little funny, you know, because you say, nah, I don't want to do it. That's why. You're going to be honest about it. And that's fine, you see. I don't want to go out tonight and meet with these people and party. I just don't want to do it. So you don't just say, I'm sort of tired. And, but I don't know, I might make it, but don't really count on You know how we go through a whole routine like that? And you say, hey, you know, I'm not going to be there tonight. I have other plans. Even if the other plan is to, to collapse on the couch. <laughs> That's a plan, isn't it? You don't have to lie about it. But when you kick yourself like that in other people, then again, you set up brain patterns that you don't really want to deal with. And people already do enough self-sabotage as it is without doing any additional things like that. So one way would be to be more honest with ourselves. And I know that's not easy. It is simple, but not easy. It's not easy to do that, but it will help. I can promise you that, that it will really help in order to get off the excuse wagon and deal with it in a more direct fashion. When you stop to think about it, you'll find all kinds of negative self-commands people give themselves all day long. You, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, let's have some examples of things that people say, and when you take them literally, they're very negative. You'll give me a pain. You'll give me a pain. That's a real pain. Yeah. People use that one a lot, right? People say, that's a pain in the neck. <laughs> or it's a pain in the back. Or a little lower, <laughs> lower back. And then people, if you repeat this often enough, with enough emphasis, the brain believes it and will do whatever it can. So the brain, in essence, works like this, right? So a person says, you know, this is a real pain, this is a real pain, this is a real pain. Eventually the brain gets it and says, oh, I see, you want a pain, is that it? And you say, yes, it's a real pain. And the brain says, all right, one pain coming up. <laughs> like a good short order cook, you know, one pain coming up. <laughs> what else? Uh, somebody else had sick another one. I'm sick and tired. Sick and tired of this or that. Oh, yeah. I'm sick and tired. This is a double shot. <laughs> not just sick, <laughs> not just tired, but sick and tired. I, I have a son, and when he was about five years old, he came home one day and told me that exact phrase. I asked him to clean up some stuff he had on the floor. And he stood up and he said to me, five years old, okay, he says to me, I'm sick and tired of cleaning up my stuff. <laughs> so I'm sort of taken aback, a five-year-old child saying that. And so I look him in the eye and I say to him, Eric, um, I'm sorry to hear that. And he looks at me, he doesn't know what is happening here. I said, where does it hurt? And he says, what are you talking about? I said, well, I thought that you said you were sick. Do you, are, you see your stomach feel a little queasy? Do you have a headache? Or in what way do you feel sick? And he says, well, I'm okay. I said, oh, all right. Now, I did hear you say that you were tired. Now, I have a wonderful remedy for that. You go to bed early. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to go to bed early. I said, oh, well, you're not tired. He says, no, I have lots of energy. Look at me. And he jumps up and down in front of me to show how much energy he had. So I said, let me see if I have this clear now. You are not sick because you say you're fine, and you're also not tired, right? He says, yeah, that's right. I said, well, why on earth would you tell me that you're sick and tired then? He said, well, I don't know. And he went on and disappeared. He has never said it again. And I don't blame him. If somebody would nail me like that, I wouldn't say it again either, you know? <laughs>
But he heard that somewhere in the school, or one of the adults, or another kid, say it, and it has a nice little oomph to it, so it sounded good to him. So he said, hey, I'm going to do it that way, and he kept on repeating that. And if I didn't know anything about this material, I would not have said anything, because the parent doesn't pay too much attention to it if you don't know that that might be damaging. And that might have become one of his pet favorite phrases, because he really liked the sound of that. Yeah, what else do people say? You give me a headache. Oh, isn't that a wonderful one here? First of all, when we say that another person is doing it to us, makes us the victim, right? So first of all, we are playing victim. And playing victim means that we're walking around with a big sign on our behind saying, please kick here. <laughs> And let me assure you, if you were to do that, you're going to find people are going to oblige you. So we don't want to play victim, because if you are a victim, it means you have no control. And we are teaching the exact opposite. We're talking about self, mind control. So saying, you give me a headache, is a ludicrous statement to begin with. The other person cannot give you a headache, unless they were actually were taking a hammer and pounding on your head. And since they're not doing that, when a person says that, what they're really saying is, I am responding to you in such a way that I'm creating a headache for myself. That's the truth. And if you're doing it in that fashion, by all means, go ahead and do it. Create your headache if you wish. So it's not a true statement. You're lying when you say it. Nobody gets you angry. Nobody gets you upset. Nobody gives you a headache. No one does that. Now, I grant you that somebody might be very nasty. Please, yes, I can totally appreciate the fact. But it is your response to whatever happens to you that determines how you're going to feel about it. You have a choice to respond and become angry, or you have a choice not to. It's up to you. And if you choose to respond in a negative way, then fine, so be it. But it is your choice. The other person has nothing to do with it. All right? What else do people say? About like uh, like the media, you see uh, cold remedy commercials, and mm -hmm. somebody this poor sucker is miserable. And oh he's yeah. Tested, you know? Oh yeah. Remember this one? The cold and flu season is here. Oh yeah, right. Forget it. <laughs> oh my God! I better go out and buy some, right? Yeah. Of course, it is programming. If you accept that, sure. If you accept that it is time to catch a cold, it is very easy to oblige. Because the brain is very powerful, right? The brain says, oh, sure. Hey, you want one? Let's go and find one. Because you have to catch one, right? Mm, yeah, this one is mine. This one has my name on it. It's very easy to do so. And there's a lot of programming statements that we have learned. Maybe your mom or dad said to you, don't wear wet socks. Because if you wear wet socks, you're going to catch a cold. Anyone there? Or if you go, no, don't go outside with wet hair. You're going to catch a cold. I wonder what all the people do at the beaches who swim in the ocean and are sitting out with wet hair. How come they don't catch colds? Well, you see, in the ocean it doesn't count. It only counts in the street, not in the ocean. What else do people say? That's impossible. The word impossible is another one. When you talk about you and say, well, I, I, I think that's impossible for me. Be very careful with that. Because you'll find that very few things are impossible. It is usually a time frame word. It used to be impossible to go to the moon till it was done in 1969, right? All of a sudden it became possible. It is impossible for the bumblebee to fly because the wingspan is too short for the body weight. It's true. You, and every, you know, someone, I don't know whether this is true or not, somebody told me up that they have this up on an engineering department, on a blow-up, in the Boeing company. And they have that. They have a picture of a bumblebee, and it says underneath, it is impossible to fly for the bumblebee because the wingspan is too short for the body weight. And from a mechanical engineering point of view, with our current knowledge, that's an absolute true fact. Of course, the bumblebee doesn't know this, so it just goes and flies. <laughs> Yeah, but it's doing something impossible to our current knowledge. 
And maybe you're still using some impossibles for you that were impossible for you when you were four. But not now that you are 24, 44, 84. Right? We have this old belief system yet. How about people who drop something, then they start proving themselves. Hey, I'm clumsy. Look at how clumsy I am. Boy, am I clumsy. After a while, we will become that way, will we not? We'll be right. You and I always get to be right. Isn't this wonderful? You always get to be right. Because whatever you say is true for you. If you repeat it often enough, make strong enough impressions on the brain, it will become true. Have you ever had someone say this to you? Um, I've been worrying about it a lot and it finally happened. <laughs> yeah. How about people who say things like, uh, to go back to uh, the physical level again, that burns me up. Well, fever would take care of that, right? <laughs> I cannot stand that. Maybe a problem with the back or the feet. Uh, I remember uh, I took my car in for a repair some years ago, and the man who was handling the paperwork he said to me, he said, uh, I'll have this guy take care of it for you. He said, hey, stupid, come over here. I said, uh, I'd like a different mechanic, please. <laughs> <laughs> because even if my man by a wonderful man, if he'd been programmed to be stupid, I surely didn't want to work him on my car. And of course, very negative. And a lot of negativity gets done to children. And it is done not in any knowing way. I want you to appreciate that. It's not done deliberately that people do not know. But if you say to a child, you'll never amount to anything in anger, for instance, that obviously is not very pleasant advice. That is a very negative program that's going on. And when you say to a child who has never done this particular thing before, when they don't do it right the first time, oh, you'll never learn how to do that right then, of course, again, that is very negative programming. And an extreme example of, of that uh, are people that still have problems with what they were told when they were three, four, five years old, 20, 30, 40 years later. It is still in there, and they're having to deal with it, and they go into therapy and what have you because of statements like that. Now, fortunately, the ones that you really want to pay attention to are the ones you repeat a lot. It isn't the ones that you say once in a while. It is the ones that are repeated all the time. The repetition is what does it. Does it. Does it. The word kill is a very negative word as well. This job is killing me. We used as an example earlier. These kids are killing me. A mom, frustrated and tired, might say, right? These kids are killing me. Cancer runs in the family. Oh, yeah. Negative programming pertaining to health. This is another problem. Cancer runs in the family, the example here, yes? We talked about we don't remember much in the first two, three, four years of our lives, but that is when a lot of programming takes place. In other words, here is this two-year-old at a family get-together. And usually a family get-together, sooner or later, people start giving war stories. By war stories, I mean what happened to them, sickness and illness-wise, and scars. Let me see, you think that is a bad scar, somebody might say. Let me show you my scar. It runs around on the side in a circle and makes an arrow to the left over here. Now, that is a scar. <laughs> and, of course, negative things like a heart problems run in the family, cancer runs in the family. That, that is highly negative. Because, again, three years old now, judgment faculties are not fully developed. You're three years old and you hear that something runs in the family. Do you belong to this family? Oh, yes. Well, there's only one way to prove that. A lot of programming is on because of old, false belief systems that are perpetuated from generation to generation. There are, of course, thousands of words and phrases we unknowingly use that are negative self-programming statements. The word can't is a very negative word, for instance. People say such things as, I can't take it anymore, I can't handle it, I can't remember names. And the word die is also used very indiscriminately, such as, I'm dying of thirst, I'm dying to get there, I'm dying to see her. When it comes to money, there are all kinds of negative statements, such as, money is the root of all evil, 
money burns a hole in my pocket. I never have any money left over at the end of the month. Or I can't afford the things I want. It seems like I'm always broke. People don't want to pay me what I'm worth. I'm unlucky with money. When it comes to being overweight, there's a whole array of self-programming statements that people use, such as, no matter what I do, I can't seem to lose weight. Everything I eat goes right to my hips. I lose weight, but then I regain it all back. All I have to do is look at food and I gain weight. Now that you are more attuned to how these destructive statements you have innocently been using may affect you, you will start discovering that there are many statements and pet phrases that, when taken literally, can be extremely damaging. What can you do to identify and eliminate these negative thoughts? Well, in Silva we say, when you catch yourself thinking or saying negative things, or when other people are giving you negative information or input, do something very simple. Say this one word twice. Cancel, cancel. See how simple it is? Just those two words. Cancel, cancel. These words will be a cue to your brain that you are no longer accepting this negative feedback. Practice this. You need to practice till the old pattern has changed. Let's suppose you have to do a particular task and you look at the clock and you say to yourself, I'm never going to get that done on time. The first thing you do is say the words, cancel, cancel, out loud or in your mind. The second thing you do is to replace the negative statement with a positive one. You can say something like, I have plenty of time to get the work done. Now let's check in again with the class where we discuss negative versus positive approaches. We're talking about negative programming and a lady about five, six years ago stood up in class and she says to me, well, but what if it's true? I said, what do you mean? She says, I hate my ex-husband's guts. <laughs> I said, all right, let's examine it. For how long have you been divorced? She says, a little over 10 years. All right. And for 10 years long, you've been saying that you hate your ex-husband, right? She says, yep, it's true. So, okay, it's true. I believe you. I said, how is he holding up under all this negativity? And she said, well, he doesn't care at all. He just goes around and has a wonderful time in life. I said, oh, I see. And how are you holding up? And she says, well, I'm having a real tough time. When a person sends out, this is what takes place. I'm going to draw a stick figure here. One person and he is another person. So we're going to call person A and person B. Took me years to learn to draw like this. <laughs> so person A, this lady is an example here, is sending out this negative thought to her ex-husband, right? I hate your guts. That's pretty negative, I would say. What she did not understand was that there are mental laws at work. There are mental laws just as there are physical laws. In other words, we're all familiar with the law of gravity. Somebody goes to the top of a high building and jumps off, what's going to happen to them? They go down. The law of gravity is in effect. Now, what's so interesting about laws is that the law functions whether one believes in it or not. In other words, somebody who goes to the top of a building and jumps off and says, I do not believe in the law of gravity, as they're jumping off, <laughs> what's going to happen to them? They're still going to go down and break some bones, right? Because it doesn't make any difference. The law just is. Now, anyone ever work in an office of some kind? Yeah? Okay. This is what I call the office principle. And that is, before a letter or a memo or anything gets sent out from an office, they always keep a copy for the file, right? In case somebody calls then and said, hey, reference to your letter and so on. Now, when you send out thoughts to someone, you always keep a copy for the file. As a matter of fact, the copy goes into the file before the letter gets sent out, right? Yes. So this lady is saying, I hate my ex-husband. 
the first thing that this person is doing is sending a copy of that to themselves. Now, it doesn't say in the copy, I hate his guts. She says, I hate my guts, is what it says in the copy. So she is sending a message to herself of self-hatred. Now, she is sending out this message of hatred to this other person, in this case her ex-husband. The ex-husband says, no thanks, I'm not buying today. What happens? The other person is not interested in accepting this negative thought. What happens? It goes back to the sender, doesn't it? Yep. Here it goes. Another one. We have now two messages saying, I hate my guts. Guess what happens to somebody when you do that for about 10 years? No wonder she was so miserable. So I told her the very best advice I can give you is to first stop doing it. Step number one is to stop doing that. You know? It's a little bit like that old joke. You know, man goes to a doctor and has his arm really twisted around his neck like that and says, Doctor, when I do this, it really hurts. And the doctor says, Stop doing it. <laughs> What's the point in doing that? Okay, the second thing is to change that pattern. Okay, the first step is to become aware that you're doing it. You can only change something once you become aware of it. So become aware of the fact that you're doing it, and then that's A. B is to stop doing it, and then C is to change the pattern. So see, you're trying to tell me I should think of my husband as in a loving way? I said, if you could, it would be wonderful. She said, but I don't think that's possible. I said, all right, start off with neutrality then. <laughs> you can work your way up, but start with neutralizing that. How do you neutralize it? You cancel it out. You cancel out the feelings of hatred. Then if you're up to it, you can then work on positive feelings. But at least it is, at this point, canceled out. What is so nice about it, it works both ways. Let's use an example. You have a friend of yours, your friend is a little down, a little depressed. And so you want to send loving thoughts to your friend. Can you do that? Sure you can. You send nice, loving thoughts, pink hearts, or whatever you're sending. What's the first thing that's going to happen when you send out positive thoughts? That loving thought goes to you. You're sending, I love me. There's nothing wrong in saying that. We can all use that one. Now you're sending a positive thought to your friend. Will your friend say, oh, gee, thanks a lot, and take it? Sure. Maybe yes, maybe no. But maybe your friend responds in saying, I don't want your loving thoughts. I want to be miserable a little while longer. Try me next week. So this person is rejecting. Keep in mind, every person has the power and the ability to accept or reject. Even though logically it says they ought to, they don't have to. So this person might reject your loving thoughts. Either way, you win. This is win-win. If they accept, you win. If they don't accept, you win. It just goes back to you. So it's a win-win situation. So put this into practice. And you'll find that some very nice, positive things will happen in your life. I highly recommend that you use this with people that you don't like too well. The people you already like a lot, you're already doing it. It's the people that you don't like a lot. Silver graduate told me a story. She had a neighbor of hers, and her neighbor knew that the pharmacist which they were going to was a friend of hers. So the neighbor complained to the silver grad. Instead of going directly to the pharmacist and complain about the service, she went to the neighbor and she figured the neighbor will tell her that way I don't have to face the pharmacist, you know? So she bitterly complained. She says, this guy doesn't even look at me when I come in to get my prescription filled. He doesn't greet me. He's been doing this for 10 years. He doesn't even know my name. He doesn't even know who I am. He treats me like I'm a total stranger. As a matter of fact, he doesn't say anything. He treats me horribly. And it, the only reason that I'm not leaving and going elsewhere is because the next pharmacist is so far away from me, I would take a lot of extra traveling time. But I want you to go and tell your friend how nasty he is to people and that he's losing a lot of business in being that way. Maybe he'll shape up. So the silver guest says, all right, I'll see what I can do for you. A week later, the neighbor stops by and says to the silver grad, 
wow, you really must chew them out good because this guy is wonderful. I can't believe it, the total transformation. I came in and he gave me a big smile and he greeted me by name and he said, I tell you what, I normally tell you, come back in 20 minutes, I want you to stay right here, I'm going to do yours right now, so that you don't have to wait. She says, he treated me like a queen. Boy, whatever you said to him, boy, it worked wonders. You really must have laid into him. And she says, what did you tell him? And the silver grass says, well, this is what I said to him. I told him that you thought that he was the best pharmacist that you had ever done business with in your 65 years of doing business with pharmacists that he was a warm, caring individual, that you loved the way he took care of you, and that you were going to recommend him to everybody you knew as a wonderful person to go and do business with. <laughs> I want you to be the pharmacist for one second. And have somebody come to you and say, this person raves about you, thinks you're wonderful. You say, oh, let me go through the files. Who is this person? What's her name? Oh, yeah. They are, oh, I know who it is. She gets in that van. Wow. You have your mental flag out from that lady comes in. You're going to let her know how much you appreciate her, right? Just the opposite of what she expected. There was no chewing out at all. Not one negative comment was made to this man. Just purely positive, And it works like a charm. And you know something? Everybody responds to that. Everybody responds to that. You and I and all human beings respond to getting positive feedback about ourselves. I don't know anybody who enjoys being put down. And I don't know anyone who does not enjoy being praised. So what you want to do is praise, praise, praise. You have people, they do something wrong, they do something right, ignore what they're doing wrong, and praise what they're doing right. That's how they train animals, you know. (laughs) They do. (laughs) If it works for the animals, maybe it will work on the humans. (laughs) It's true. Now, if you take a good animal trainer, there will be no whips, no nothing. Good animal trainers will train by ignoring what the animal is doing wrong and giving positive feedback, usually in the form of food, for doing something right. And after a while, the animal stops doing things wrong because there is no positive feedback. So put these little things into practice. Let me offer another way to maintain a positive outlook. The question that you hear most often when you meet people is, how is it going? How are you doing? And in silver, we use an answer to that question that will help both you as well as your listener. We respond to that question by saying, I'm doing better and better. Thanks. How are you? The key words here are better and better, which actually is a shortcut version of one of the positive phrases that we teach. The positive phrase in its totality goes... Every day, in every way, I am getting better, better, and better. This is one of the positive phrases that is used in the next exercise, where you are again going to explore the alpha dimension. We will begin this exercise by asking you to assume a comfortable sitting position. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath. And go deeper. You are now at a deeper, healthier level of mind, deeper than before. To help you enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, I'm going to count from ten to one. On each descending number, you will feel yourself going deeper, and you will enter a deeper, healthier level of mind. Ten, nine, feel going deeper. Eight, seven, six, deeper and deeper. Five, four, three, deeper and deeper. Two, one. You are now at a deeper, healthier level of mind, deeper than before. You may enter a deeper, healthier level of mind by simply relaxing your eyelids. Relax your eyelids. Feel how relaxed they are. 
Allow this feeling of relaxation to flow slowly downward throughout your body, all the way down to your toes. It's a wonderful feeling to be deeply relaxed, a very healthy state of being. To help you enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, I'm going to count from one to three. At that moment, you will project yourself mentally to your ideal place of relaxation. I will then stop talking to you, and when you next hear my voice, one hour of time will have elapsed at this level of mind. My voice will not startle you. You will take a deep breath, relax, and go deeper. One. Two, three. Project yourself mentally to your ideal place of relaxation until you hear my voice again. Relax. Relax. Take a deep breath and go deeper. You will continue to listen to my voice. You will continue to follow the instructions at this level of the mind and any other level, including the outer conscious level. This is for your benefit. You desire it, and it is so. Whenever you mentally or verbally mention the word relax, all unnecessary movements and activities of your body, brain, and mind will cease immediately, and you will become completely passive and relaxed physically and mentally. I may bring you out of this level or a deeper level than this by counting to you from one to five. At the count of five, your eyes will open. You will be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health. The difference between genius mentality and lay mentality is that geniuses use more of their minds and use them in a special manner. You are now learning to use more of your mind and to use it in a special manner. The following are beneficial statements that you may occasionally repeat while at these levels of mind. Repeat mentally after me. My increasing mental faculties are for serving humanity better. Every day, in every way, I am getting better, better, and better. Positive thoughts bring me benefits and advantages I desire. The next silver mind control exercise will include the alpha sound that will help you to relax physically and mentally so that you may enter deeper, healthier levels of mind. Every time you function at these levels of the mind, you will receive beneficial effects physically and mentally. You may use these levels of the mind to help yourself physically and mentally. You may use these levels of the mind to help your loved ones physically and mentally. You may use these levels of the mind to help any human being who needs help physically and mentally. You will never use these levels of the mind to harm any human being. If this be your intention, you will not be able to function within these levels of the mind. You will always use these levels of the mind in a constructive, creative manner. In a moment, I'm going to count from one to five. At that moment, you will open your eyes, be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. You will have no ill effects whatsoever in your head, no headache. No ill effects whatsoever in your hearing, no buzzing in your ears. 
No ill effects whatsoever in your vision and eyesight. Vision, eyesight, and hearing improve every time you function at these levels of mind. One, two, coming out slowly now. Three, at the count of five, you will open your eyes, be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. Feeling the way you feel when you have slept the right amount of revitalizing, refreshing, relaxing, healthy sleep. Four, five. Eyes open, wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. Mm-hmm.